The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, guys. Uh, my name is Thomas Lovejoy. I'm the IHQ representative here. With us, we've got Steve Bacher, president of the 1848 Housing Committee, and Mark Crittenbrink of Crittenbrink Architecture. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Steve Bacher right now. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Brothers, thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to have you with us. This is uh, um, our last webinar of the 2019 calendar year. Um, and uh, we appreciate, I know many of you that are um, listening in on this have listened, to, listened in on several other of our uh, webinars. I just want to remind you that uh, we record these, and these are available for you to listen to or to share with uh, associates of yours on the House Corporation um, at any time. The link is uh, at the FIGAM.org website under the Graduate tab and under the Housing tab. Tonight, I'm really excited because uh, we have a great um, uh, speaker in Mark Crittenbrink from uh, Crittenbrink Architecture. Mark's uh, firm has uh, uh, specializes in Greek housing. About 60% of their practice is in the Greek housing area. I had the uh, privilege of uh, hearing Mark and a few other architects speak at a, a fraternity housing conference a few months ago. And uh, Mark uh, is definitely an expert in this field. And uh, we're going to um, uh, have him uh, give us a great presentation and then open it up for questions. So be thinking of the things that you want to ask Mark and uh, Thomas at the end of the presentation will explain how that process will work. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Mark. Hey Steve, thank you so much. With me here today is also Sean Lorg. Sean is our Director of Design here at Crittenbrink Architecture. Uh, so I understand our focus of our, of our, of our story tonight uh, just a little bit more about us. We, we do do Greek architecture. It's the majority of our work. Um, we work, work on West Coast, East Coast, uh, you know, as far south as Miami, Florida. Um, and that background kind of gives you some insight into certain components that I, that I would like to share with you all tonight. Um, I think there's an initial analysis that goes into considering a building project. And my goal would be that I'd be able to share just some key points that I think might allow you to go through some of your own analysis on your own. I, I'm going to speak for probably 10 to 12 minutes and I'll have a few pictures at the end. And um, if you ever could hold their questions, so then that would be awesome. So when somebody's considering a building project, almost the first thing that comes up, they're considering, should it be a renovation project or should I build new? Um, well, nobody knows because you haven't done the analysis. But the good news is, is that the process, the initial process is the same. You know, your needs are what they are. Your wants are what they are. You can't build a new project or renovate a new project and not be seeing forward to the next 10, 20, 30 years. So the good news is all the initial programming, those initial steps are all the same. So you are faced with that decision, but you're allowed to go through a process that leads you to that decision, whatever it might be, uh, easily. Now there's lots of questions we ask and lots of different directions we take, but I've, but I've, I've picked up on three tonight that I thought would be helpful and might engage us in conversation. Um, and that's what you see there, analysis, campus culture, and then alumni consideration. So let's say you're looking at looking at a project. You're not sure if it's new construction or, or renovation, but you're trying to figure out what you can do. The, you know, the first thing I'm going to do or, or any probably building professional is going to do is going to come in and examine existing conditions. You know, what, what, what are your existing conditions? How is your mechanical, electrical, plumbing? Are you spending $60,000 a year in repairs on your plumbing? If so, that's a problem. So how does that get addressed? Um, but, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, those are issues that can be resolved. Something a little less flexible structure. How solid is your structure? I mean, if you've got structural issues in your house, there's reasons for it, and they may be corrected. But that will typically make you think, we need to really analyze this before we think about going back with the renovation. I also think you have code issues, life safety, uh, ADA. I was in a house in Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and... They have two hallways that lead to two fire escapes. The doors that lead out of those 
both of those fire escapes are four feet tall and the corridors leading to them are used for storage. So there, there's no way that you can, you know, ignore that situation. And to me, that's the first thing you want to check on to make sure that if something happens, your men can get out safely. And then depending on the, the depth of your uh, um, uh, renovation, you may be required to, to convert, you come up to standards with, with ADA. Minimally, that would be access to the building and to most functions of the floor. Um, you look at some things like parking. What kind of parking do you have? Do you have enough? Do you need more? Um, and, and from all this gathering of information, just establish, this is what I have. This is what I have to start with functionally. And then you create a, an idea program or a wish list of what it is you want to see happen. Because that helps you to see what, what it is you can achieve with what you have. So that analysis of, analysis of all your existing conditions is pretty significant. And the next thing is campus culture or campus competition. You know, look at what the others are doing. Uh, you are competitive with the other fraternities on campus, so your housing needs to be competitive. Um, I was at a house in Indiana, and it's an old house that they'd like to renovate, which they could do with some success, but the, uh, there's a new fraternity going on a half block away, and two more are scheduled to be built in the next two years. So you have to look and see, looking down the road, if I do this, am I going to be able to compete with what's going on on my school, what's going on on my campus? Additionally, you know, every, every fraternity has its own culture, which I think is reflective of the community. You know, we did a, we're doing a house at USC, and it was a necessity that they have a full-size volleyball court. It was that big a deal to them. Not everybody's going to want that. So you just kind of have to figure out, do I need that, do I not? Bed count. You know, what are the other fraternities sleeping? What's the average size? At what we are, are we a small fraternity on campus? And is that how we want to represent? Or do I need to increase that size? Uh, what do the other groups have for, you know, group meetings? You know, you may have 40 that live in, but you may have 100 to 120 come over once a week or for special events or whatnot. How do you accommodate that? Um, Parking, of course, plays into that if you need it, if the culture is there that you need parking or if code requires you to have parking. I think location, you look at where you are, are you the farthest down from campus? Do you have to ramp up that street, street appearance to, to get more attention? Uh, but honestly, just, just looking at that college culture um, to see how you are, uh, how you're going to stand up with any improvement that you're going to make. And finally, I would talk about the alumni. Um, you know, the alumni have an emotional tie to the building, to the architecture. Uh, they, re they remember everything. It maybe represents, as it should, some of the best years of their life. And so all the conditions they lived in are acceptable. So I don't think they always understand why you need to make the changes. But you look at the young men that are coming to school today, they probably have never shared a bedroom or a bathroom. So that four bedroom in 1969 is now a single or at most a double. So I think you have to look and see, the alumni have to understand, do you have a room that will be big enough for everybody to sit down and eat a meal? Do you have a room big enough for everybody to have chapter? Um, you know, how, how, how are you going to get them engaged? We had situations where we felt, we had this one situation and I'm gonna show you a picture. Uh, where you walk into the house and usually I say, well, we need to examine it. We need to see if, uh, um, uh, you know, we can save it or not. And I walked through and I thought, yeah, we can never save that. Uh, so, so we did some research and we came up with this. This was your way, this is, was the original house. This is a Fiji house. That was the original house on East on Northside Greek. Um, and I think they moved out in the 60s and built a very contemporary house on the, uh, in, in West Greek. But if you, Sean, why don't you discuss this a little bit? Uh, the uh, very classical architecture, uh, symmetrically balanced, um, a lot of uh, ornateness uh, to the to the building itself uh, that we tried to emulate. Um, the um, I would add that the the alumni base is. Tying them to the actives in some way yeah. is a very important component of what we do. Um, and so recognition, clearly the money is coming from the alumni base. So that's that's what we do understand as a, as a hard fact. 
Um, and so they do need to have their needs met. However, what Mark was alluding to was the the idea of um, the evolution of these houses and and the arrangements with with regard to sleeping units, um, amenities, and things of that nature um, become of the utmost importance. And, be, and that's that's largely because you're competing with other houses. So um, as long as you stay on those bases and and look again to to escalate that evolution, um, I think you can be successful. So this is the house that we ended up with. Um, it, you can see it mimics a lot of the same features, the arches over the windows, the columns, the colonnade, the, uh, that big band of stone around the top. The difference is that big band before was painted wood. Uh, those columns were wood. So all the materials on this, you also want to show your alumni that they're not going to have a lot of wear and tear. There's not one product on the outside of that building that they have to maintain other than, you know, take care of it. Take care of it. Um, but again, we did this to appeal to the alumni. Hey, we understand this is the house you like. Here's what we're doing to make you feel comfortable when you come. So that was the deal. That was where they tore down the house and that was a brand new house. The next project was a project in Seattle. This was the sorority that had gone off campus in the 90s. Uh, they were very proud of that addition on the right, which was a contemporary addition. Uh, they had, uh, well, it's just, there, there's just a lot of mess being cooked in this house when we went through. Uh, so, you know, we looked, they, this is the main street where that woman's walking. They're right across the street from the university. They had absolutely no relationship. Their entry was on the side. This, this house was sad, and this sorority wanted to be something more traditional. So working within that framework, we created this, this house. Next slide, please, Thomas which is showing everything is there. We added pitched roof on the top, added a colonnade. But again, this, this is AOPI, they're out of the South. They want to, re, they want to reflect that in their housing. Uh, next slide, Tom. Um, and, and again, another view, uh, just on what the contemporary nature. Yeah, you can go next, that'd be good. We had to put an elevator in this to make it all code compliant. There's actually seven different levels in this house because it was added on to at different times. But you can see on how along the street, obviously that's a much more stately presence than what it had before and much more along the lines of what they were after. So all we added here was the colonnade. So a, a total renovation. Next slide was Indiana. You did that project, huh? I mean, uh, Sean. Yeah, the uh, Indiana, again, a, a pretty contemporary um, uh, this is Alpha Gamma Delta House at University of Indiana, or Indiana University, I'm sorry, and um, in Bloomington. It, uh, again, is very contemporary looking. Um, the sorority life is a little more, uh, let's say, aesthetically driven um, on the exterior of the building. They certainly have put a high emphasis on their branding and things like that. And it's also something I believe that fraternities can certainly learn from as well, is having a kind of a universal brand across their across your organization uh, with regard to the aesthetic and that type of thing. Um, jump to the next slide real quick, and we'll, we'll discuss the the, renovate, the uh, pretty dramatic, and both of these, both of these two projects are very dramatic in their, their their differences and their changes from that existing piece. So really what we're trying to show you here is that ultimately it doesn't matter much what you've got because we can we can pretty well anybody can can come in and, and renovate that to what you want. And so um, we've we've had a lot of experience in, in saving those buildings and then you know and when it's appropriate we like to do them new as well because that does open some things up. The things that you don't have to worry about in in a new build, certainly all your systems and things of that nature. And and 99% of the time that new build comes in the first meeting because that's what the owners decided beforehand they want to do. But so really that's that's kind of wrapping this up. I mean honestly I think if you're looking at a project, go in, um, you know, get get a good analysis of what your existing conditions and systems are. Look around you to see what the campus is doing, what your competition is doing. And then figure out what you're going to need to do to honor the input of your alumni and yet still meet the needs of your house negotiating that and it's it's engaging people at the right time honestly i think those three components are easy things that you can analyze on your own 
and it's what we do. Our, our services go beyond that. And I will say this, and I will open it up to questions. Uh, for, for if we're dealing with you for the first time, we will gladly fly out to the site and check out your existing conditions and what might be the opportunities for you. And we will do that first visit on our dime. Uh, this is our information. That's me on the left, Sean, second from the right. Uh, so we will open it up to questions for you now, please. All right, Mark, this is, this is Thomas. Um, I've, I've got a couple, uh, a, a broad question, and I know we've got a, a, at least a, a little from the, from the crowd and from Steve Walker, but my first one um, is kind of a general one. What are the most common problems that, that house corporations across the country when they're trying to do this, what's the most common problem that will come across uh, when they're trying to build or renovate? Well, probably maybe, maybe not having the alumni support that yeah, they need. The fundraising. Uh, the so fundraising. It's usually the funding component. If they, if they're, I mean, if there's a, a reasonable program, and most people tend to be reasonable, I think you expect less out of a renovation, and usually they're renovation additions, but you expect a little bit less out of that. You can actually always almost get what you want. Um, but I think it's typically financial. They either don't have the alumni base, which means they have to either get the national, they have to either get the national support or our fundraise. And it's hard to do when you don't have an alumni base. Yeah. So you can see how, uh, for people in the crowd who have seen other, other webinars, the fundraising webinar kind of weaves in with this webinar very, very, very smoothly. Um, so the other, the other half of that question is, um, how can a good architecture company help the process of building and renovating compared to if, if, a, if a house chooses not to use specific people or, or what, I guess just what is the, the benefit of using a good architecture company for this? Well, I would, I would have to say, I mean, we do this for a living, right? So that's what we do. We're architects. We design spaces. I tend to think if you go out of project, it's like, well, we need to remodel the kitchen and dining room. And anybody can come in and remodel a kitchen and dining room, but it needs to be woven into a bigger picture. I, you know, if I'm coming to you for the first time, I'm, as I said, I'm going to come in and say, hey, let's, let's create this building program and let's see everything that you're going to need. Um, I, I, Sean, don't you agree? Yeah, I think that the, I think the master planning component is something that you're going to get um, uh, from from a good architect to step in and say, hey, you know, and really really analyze your needs, uh, help you make sure that the performer works, those types of those types of things from a feasibility standpoint. In addition to, um, I think in my my opinion about good architects would also be that they immerse themselves in your culture to some extent, so that they can find out what it is that you guys do. And what I, you know, I'm kind of baffled by the the egos that we see in our business that think that they know better what you need than you do. Um, that's not the way we practice here. So we certainly are wanting to extract that information. I would say a good architect would extract the information from you and then, and then help you and, and, you know, take it from a different standpoint. So looking at that big picture, because, you know, let's say you're a group that you can't afford a big project is going to shut you down for a year, probably. Um, but you don't want to do that. You want to do your work over the summer. So you need to phase it. So what we would come in and we would, basically create a master plan for you. Here's everything, tell us what you need and then let us show you what your house can do for you. Create, and but we would show everything and then I think you would think, well, what's our highest priority? Let's go with that. So then if you phase it over the course of say two or three summers, which we've done that several times, then your plan has to be thought through where you know what you're doing phase one is going to tie in and dovetail into phase two and that you're thinking of all three phases all along. So you don't come in and reinvent the wheel every time. So it gives you the opportunity to really analyze the process of what you need. I, I think most people know they need what they know, they know what they have, and so they tend to define their options by that. And what I think we can do but most of all is take you out of that realm and let you think about the possibilities. So the, the planning and the, the investment of an architecture company could be very valuable with just the, having it all organized. Um, Steve Bacher, you well, want to go, yeah. go ahead and answer, or sorry, ask any questions that, that you had as well, and then I'll get to the uh, questions from the audience. Sounds good. And uh, you can feel free if uh, you want to mix some in. Thomas, let me know, okay? Um, guys, let's talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to come back to costs in a few minutes, but so that we don't just talk money. 
Tell us a little bit about what you've been seeing in terms of the latest trends in the newest houses that you've either designed or renovated. What, what's it looking like from um, living space kind of set up? What, what's some of the interesting or new trends that you're seeing in common area um, brotherhood building spaces? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. This is Sean. Uh, I think that uh, the they're very dynamic. These these common spaces are, have become and evolved much in the way libraries have uh, as well at universities. We do some library work as well, um, but they they become very dynamic in that everything's connected. Um, it's it's six or seven different study you know, opportunities in a space um, that would give you, you know, a, a wide variety of, of uh, learning opportunities, essentially. Um, that's a, that's kind of a big trend, and that's been happening for a little while now. We see uh, uh, fitness centers, people are trying to push, push fitness centers in-house. Um, we're seeing... Um, Creating more opportunities. We're doing a a, a fraternity that was on probation, we've done a, basically a meeting room for them all quarter, which will work for them for a meeting room as well. But they will give, uh, there'll be adult education classes out of there. Giving back to the community is something. Girls' bathrooms with showers on the upper floors is something some people are doing. Uh, women do spend the night and they go into the main bathroom. Uh, it's one of the reasons men, men move out. So it's allowing their girlfriends who will spend the night uh, to um, have a little more creature comfort. Um, the big thing I think we see, is, is, and it's, as you know, the, the phase of fraternity, housing and whatnot, I think is in a, in a fairly rapid evolution um, in terms of what's being allowed now and what's going to be allowed. I believe in 10 years, probably every, my thought is every campus is going to be dry and every national fraternity is going to probably have a dry fundamental code. Um, so we're dealing with a group on the West Coast and actually one up in Michigan where it's a wet campus. And they want this bar in this party room. I mean, California saying, yeah, you're not showing the bar. It's like, I'm not showing the bar for a reason. Um, but yeah, it's a party room. And they want it up there. And, I'm, and I told them, you know, in 10 years, you won't be able to do this. So we've tried to create those sorts of spaces in the basement as well, where um, there'd be a little less speculation as to what's going on. Just looking for those opportunities and how it changes. Great. Does that answer your question? In term, yeah, it does. How about in terms of talk talk to our 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 house corporations in terms of of room configurations? Are we uh, are you seeing any changes in that area substantially? Are you talking bedrooms, sleeping rooms? Yeah, bedrooms, bathrooms. Yep. Mm -hmm. The most effective, the most efficient square feet solution for a fraternity is probably a 60 foot wide building with a five foot corridor and six foot and then 23 by 12 spaces on either side. Um, that snaps out to a 12 foot grid so it's easy to build. That's a, that's a comfortable living arrangement for two people. Um, that can, be, that can be cut into a suite where you put a wall and you put the sleeping area on one side um, and you do the study area on the other, which increases your education square feet. Um, but looking at economy in terms of construction, we will do a real for that sort of thing. It's, real, it's repetitive. So we'll do a repetitive scale and that seems to work out the best. There occasionally we'll get to, there's a place for doing where the bank's not comfortable the attorney is going to last. And it's been designed more like an apartment house. Every bedroom has access to a bathroom. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. In that floor state. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it goes south, they have something they can do. Yeah, we're, and we're seeing more and more, more and more uh, houses are requiring uh, elevators. So we've been able to sidestep those for, for a few years, but they, they, they're bearing down on us from a requirement standpoint. And ultimately, we see that something that's that's going to be required in the future as well so uh, planning and planning and getting an elevator and that that talks back to your existing houses as well if those you know they they are not accommodating um, the full breadth of, of ADA accessibility at this point so 
um, that can be challenging as well. That's a tap dance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you brought up something, before I go on to my next question, you brought up something um, that we might as well um, stay on for a half a sec, and that is um, education space and being able to um, tap into foundation donations versus uh, regular donations. When you guys are designing a house, uh, approximately what percentage of space are you feeling comfortable um, designating as education space? I would say, depending on the conditions, 50 to 65 percent. Okay. Now, to get up that higher figure, you're going to be pulling some square footage out of your bedrooms. Would, would, a, would a brief explanation of how that works be helpful for this group? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So there are three types of square feet in your house. There's ancillary square feet, educational, and non-educational. An example of ancillary would be any stairways, hallways, foyers, anything related to circulation, the group bathrooms, mechanical rooms, storage rooms, uh, those sorts of things, right? So they're going to add up to a certain square feet. Then your non-educational square feet, which will be your house director's apartment, your dining room, your chapter room. There's no way you're going to swing those to be a study hall and a chat. You know, you're just not going to get them. Um, and space like that, um, I'm trying to say something about mouse, but then educational would be the public spaces that are geared towards education. So a library, a heritage room that tells the history of your chapter, a study lounge. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity on, on the first floor in the public spaces to get your educational square feet where you're going to need it is upstairs. So what you do is you take, let's say you got a 9,000 square foot building, all right, and 3,000 is educational, 3,000 is non-educational, and 3,000 is ancillary. Right. If you take 300 uh, or 3,000 one half, right, just throw it all in there together. You're, you can see the amount. However, if you take the, um, you take the ancillary off, so your base is at 9,000 and more 6,000. So all of a sudden, my 33% percentage just jumped up to 50%. So that's how it plays out, and you just look for that opportunity everywhere you can. Okay, great. Well, you talked a, a, um, we a little bit. I'm sorry, we provide you a report that outlines that you take it to your attorney and that's what you need for your foundation. I'm sorry, say that so again. Hold on, I didn't no, no, well, no. We will go. provide we... that. You go. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, great. Um in in your presentation we you talked about that initial assessment process. Um so talk to us a little bit about the time that that takes. So, you know, in terms of we, we at, at Bike Gamma Delta, you know, we have uh, houses, of course, across the spectrum in terms of, you know, almost brand new to, you know, uh, decades old, um, several decades old. Um, so when a house corporation you know, makes a determination that a renovation or or more is something that needs to be considered, and they call an architect. Talk to us about um, what they should expect. And I realize, you know, I'm asking a, 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 for you to answer generally, um, but what they should expect in terms of cost to get an assessment done and the amount of time that it would take for that assessment to be completed to make so that they can then make a determination of is this a renovation or is this a scrape and rebuild type of scenario so we that would be our proposal hey that would be the pre basically pre-design uh composed of a so that would take 90 to 120 days i think if once we got started um, the process would be to meet with the building committee to figure out what it is they wanted to build, what was their wish list, create a building program that outlines everything on what is, you know, not like, hey, I want to move the dining room wall five feet. No, I need a dining room that's seat 60. We just need, you know, those sorts of goals. Um, uh, create that document, create a set of field verification documents, documenting everything that you have on site, that's what you'd want, so you'd have all your existing floor plans and exterior elevations all documented and drawn up. 
So you have that product. Um, so from that, I think that first phase, you'd expect to get a building program approved, a uh, set of field verification documents put together. Um, that's what you need to start. Uh, but then creating, moving forward with the design component, taking that, that, that building program and, and working it into the design of the project. So you can look at the design, approve the design, and then if you're going to fundraise, then we would do presentation documents for you. Presentation documents, site plan, floor plans, and exterior rendering. Uh, we can do an animation, it's just more expensive. Um, so uh, that would be the process we would put you through so that you have the package that you need to move forward. When you have that, that presentation package plus a cost estimate plus the um, square footage calculation, I mean, you can't go to your alumni and say, hey, I want to add on to the house, and I don't know how much it's going to cost, and I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't think that's going to get very far, but if you say, hey, we want to add on to the house, We've done a study, we've made an analysis, we feel like this is the best bet for us, this is what it looks like, this is what it costs, here are your educational square footage opportunities. I think that's a good package, and that's the package you're looking for, something that gets you to that level. Yeah, and this, will, this, will, this package will legitimize that with your alumni, too. They'll, they'll realize you're serious about it, that engages, that engages money and funding. So that's, that's, uh, that's been a good model for us, um, in addition, we use, uh, we've used in the past. We've used uh, professional funding companies as well, and um, recommend those at times when it's appropriate uh, to to engage those as well. So, you bet. And we just actually had Columns uh, do a, pre a webinar for us um, about 60 days ago. Yeah, we're we're big believers in those guys. Um, what so? So I'm the house corporation. I've, we, we've come to the conclusion that something has to be done. We hire the architectural firm and to do this uh, pre-designed project. What, what kind of budget would you? Uh, and again, I obviously, yeah. What, what, what is this pre-design process generally going to cost? A range. I can't speak to everybody because I don't know what everybody charges. What I know from my experience is what any building committee needs to move forward and make any decision about any project is a plan, an educated plan, and the, and the documentation to back it up. Um, so, I, so you need to get there to move to the next level. You also have access to probably limited funds because you haven't fundraised yet. So what yep. we do is do what we call our proposal A, where we go through everything we talked about. We, the, uh, you know, all you can eat special, we come to town, we meet with the committee, um, uh, uh, meet with the committee building program, measure the building for the field verification, meet with the head of Greek life on campus, uh, go and meet with the city to see what their requirements are, tour the Greek campus, uh, spend some time on campus. I like to spend the uh, couple hours at lunch in the student union because it really gives you a good vibe for that. So you walk away from that first meeting with all the information that you need, you generate this building program, it gets approved. You do the design documents, it takes that written document and makes it graphic. You get it reviewed and approved, and then you create the presentation documents, which would be the, the site plan, the floor plan, all presentation format, full color, with the rendering, animation, um, and then again, the, uh, the backup. And so for that, and I'm sorry, so, so that's, we're gonna, depending on the project, that's gonna be like, Twelve to fourteen thousand dollars, sixteen to twenty thousand dollars. We're going to give you a range with a limit, and then you pay us that, which is a, a very small amount if you were than what you would typically pay to a typical contract. Which is why we do sure. it because it gets our foot in the door and it gets you to the next level. Uh, but when you move forward with it, we credit you for that for that component. So we don't you actually don't pay for it. We just like do it um, at low cost so you can move forward with it, and then we take it from there. So Good. it's no. going to range for us. The smallest project's going to be 12 to 14. Um, you know, 16 to 20. The highest we did was LA. I think it was 18 to 22. So it would okay. depend on the project, and and that's yeah. dependent on the scope of work. Absolutely. And that's just helpful, as you can imagine, as as a house corporation that maybe in in 30 or 40 years or 20 years hasn't done a project. Uh, the brothers that uh, maybe did a prior project on a round. So I think having that kind of idea of what a, bu you know, a budget to, you know, start with is, is going to be helpful to them. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, 
Um, here's here's a question. This this may be this may be a really stupid question, but I, I'm a believer that there's no such thing. So, um, what? Tell me if you if you've seen trends again. This is going to be in general of houses that were built, you know, pre '60s versus post '60s um, in terms of. You know, if I'm a house corporation, you know, um, uh, officer, and you know, I'm I'm sitting in a house that was built in 1970, which makes it now almost 50 years old. I'm I'm trying to figure out what's the useful life of that house, and and um, whether I can do things to extend that life, um, or I have to quickly come to terms that the house may be at the end of its useful life. So I guess the question is, um, do you see differences in construction, you know, from a period, you know, at a certain date that, you know, would lead somebody to believe, hey, if you've got a house built in the 80s, you know, the trend there was these are going to be lasting 50 years tops versus maybe a house built in the 60s or 70s. Is there a generalization that you can speak to in terms of what you see out there? Yeah, I, I would say in general, uh, I would say 50 years is, is pretty standard across all genres. The, the thing you get into with the older homes is is not not the, the structure. The structure is usually pretty good. They've usually had some sort of you know retro work done to them uh, to keep them up over the years, but uh, what you run into is the is the systems, the electrical systems, and the and the mechanical systems and stuff are 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 way behind from a technology standpoint. They're incredibly inefficient. Um, they're just not the best things to use. And so, um, I would say that's that's more of the tipping point is is your systems. And we typically, when we when we go into a house like that, we will replace all those systems. We, we can hold on to the integrity of the, of the kind of historical component of a house with the facade and, you know, kind of the bare bones of the project and just refresh it, but, but then come in and then allow, you know, proper mechanical space. Um, the other challenges you'll run into when doing that are, are duct runs and things of that nature, um, but you can use other systems also that are just refrigerant air systems and things like that to mitigate um, some of the floor to floor ceiling heights and things like that that would be complicated in an older build. But I, I do think, in a, it, in a, you know, there's always been bad builders um, that built bad buildings. And I think if you had a building that was built poorly in the 20s, it's probably no longer around. But you, you could have a really solid building built from the 20s and still be using it. A lot of people do use older homes. A lot of variables come into play. How much room do you have? Can you expand? Older houses, too, tend to not be able to handle the larger crowds that are the entire chapter, which are two to three times what they were when the house was built. So can you get to that big space? Um, a lot of times you can renovate an add on one addition that will take care of all the problems that your main house is missing. But, I mean, if it's crumbling, no. But I, I think you can look at any house at any era. If it was well done, you just look at it. Each It's as different as each project. You would just have to look and see sure. what can this building give us. And Great. Steve, I've, but got, if it's a, I've got a couple questions from the audience, if you're ready for those. Good. Yeah, let's throw in one. Yeah. Right. Um, this one uh, says, you spoke about common space. Um, what about room and bathroom configuration? And I assume they're talking about the, the trend. So you can, if, you, if you kind of already touched that, you can keep it short, but uh, expand on room and bathroom configuration trends. I can, I can talk a little bit. I know so, so can Sean. The, the standard, if you're holding it out there, is a group bathroom. Uh, you know, it has individual showers, toilet partitions, urinals, and then plenty of sink space. It's all durable product. Um, but that's the standard with individual bedrooms. We've done a house where there is a four-man study, if you will, that connected to two small bedrooms that shared a bathroom. So for every four men, there was a bathroom. Um, and then this project we just did at Florida State was geared towards it could function as an apartment building. Uh, I think, again, you kind of look at your budget, you look at your existing building, and then look at the campus culture to see what the, you know, what's, what's common here. We did a, a, that project in Indiana, it has a sleeping porch that sleeps 
98 women in four different rooms. And that would so never fly on so many campuses, but it's what everybody does up there. So, you know, you, you wouldn't see that you could do that. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. There's, there's a, you know, from campus to campus, it's, you know, that's, that's, it's relative to what you can and can't do as well. And what, it, what is part of that culture. So that's, a, that's a very important thing is, is understanding what the allowables are and what the trends are because they're going to they're going to be different across each each campus um, you will have some generalities as well but but uh, the campus culture is certainly very important and i'll i'll dip i'll dip into that a little bit differently so let's talk bedrooms and bathrooms um i i think you're going to find that most areas will have the um, um the, the uh, i spaced my thought i lost my train of thought carry on the uh I, th I think I may know where he was going, but uh, the uh, the bathrooms are, in in general, uh, I think most of them are, from a trend standpoint, are, are just allowing to have, like he said, a, a large bathroom um, that's a communal bathroom with private space in it. So that's that's what we see as to be most effective at this point is, is allowing you to have your own private space in those communal bathrooms because you know that's it's not the way nobody nobody takes a shower together anymore that's that's not very typical um, and when you look at the bedrooms i think if it's new you can build a whole lot of bedrooms that are just alike if you're in an existing house you probably have the opportunity to create the different size bedrooms i always think it's good to have a hierarchy of rooms so you have a reason for your upperclassmen to maybe stay in and continue that leadership uh, so maybe that's a wing it's like four or six rooms that have their own bath and little common area between them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a two bedroom, but you've got a busy year. It can easily swell to a three bedroom. So you have a little flex there. So you're not locked in at 46, but you could do 50 if things are going well. So I do think you want to, you got to look at flexibility of space throughout the house. And that extends up to the bedrooms as well on how they can flex and how they can give you different presentations. Okay, good. So we've got another question. Um, it says, what is the ballpark construction cost of new versus a remodel? Uh, like, for example, cost per square foot, uh, things like that. And does that vary based on location? Well, it certainly varies on location, but in general, we're seeing, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it, the cost escalation, I'll, I'll first say, is going up about $25 a square foot per year. So you're never going to be able to build it as cheaply as you can or as cost effectively as you can today. Um, that number seems to be, in a, and again, it's, it's different across the country, but it ranges from, oh, we're doing some, at, some in the range of 275 would kind of be the low end at this point, 275 a square foot to, you know, 325 a square foot, somewhere in that range, I think is what we're seeing. So. Um, that would be for new. That's for new. Um, and then on re on the renovation side, um, we get that around about sixty percent, sixty five percent. Yeah, that's probably right. Depending on how much renovation you have, how much new you're adding, um, you know, a lot of variables. But I think you're going to land somewhere sixty five percent of new construction will probably hit your renovation. Understanding you're probably not getting as much out of a renovation that you may have out of new construction, but you've got your site and demolition costs and whatnot, and that adds into it. So I would say six. So yeah, two two fifty three twenty five is per foot new, and then sixty five percent of that for renovation. All right, perfect. And then the the last question we got from the audience is how important is it to use a local architecture company versus an out of state architecture company? Uh, if the prices are better, reviews are better whatever, um, is that something that people should consider or should they just go with the best company? I'll answer that one. I, I, I feel pretty strongly about this one. Um, most of what I would look for is your building type. Your building type is the most important thing here and it doesn't have anything to do with where your firm, where the firm is. Um, it, have they done that building type before? Because everybody thinks they know how to do a sorority or fraternity. And the facts are that they just don't. And so um, there's a learning curve, and you have to make a decision on whether or not you, you know, is, is the local guy, does the local guy, has he done one before? Does he understand the trends? Does he understand the pitfalls of an R2 construction, uh, you know, 
those types of things. And, and in general, we, and we run across the same thing with contractors. Uh, we, we hold, we kind of hold like a select bid process where we will use a contractor that has done one. And we highly recommend using one that's done one because they can, they understand the process more and they understand the deadlines are very, very serious. And that, you know, the magnitude of missing a deadline is, is catastrophic at times. So, um, we find that in both regards that the most, the most important thing in that is that they've done your building type, that they've done that R2 construction of fraternity or sorority. Well, and here's the thing, there's really no building code that addresses freak. It's always an interpretation between you're not a hotel, you're not a dorm, you're not an apartment building, you're not a rooming house. So it, it just gets squirrely. And so navigating that process is a big part of it. Plus, this is what we do 65% of the time. We bring in expertise. We carry, we carry a knowledge of what are the current trends. Um, a, a person who deals with the topic all the time on a national basis wouldn't just be me, there'd be others, but they would know what the trends were and they would know well, this is where you need to be going. It's like, now nah, you don't really want to build a dining room that'll see 250 people when that only happens once a week. Let's figure out another alternative. Uh, and just walking through that process. All right, I do have one more um, question from the audience and then uh, get this one answered. So does your firm oversee the project from design through build, even though you may not be a design build architecture engineering firm? Uh, yeah, we do. And I'll start this and then, and then I'll let Sean finish. So I'm usually the first person that you see because I'm the one that's going to go out and examine the project to begin with. And so it's a process where you're working with me and, and, and my team uh, but when, it, when we start laying out the design, that's when Sean gets involved. So there's kind of a transition to Sean, and that team will carry you through the project. We'll carry you through, you know, the rest of design, the construction documents, the permit applications, and stay with you all the way until you move in. Uh, that last last phase is construction administration. So, like we do this all the time. So right now we're doing um, a project in uh, USC. Uh, so it's every two weeks. We have a, every week we have a conference call. Everybody has homework, move forward from there. Um, and then, you know, every month you're out there to monitor to see what's going on. It doesn't have to be every month. At the beginning, it can be every two, three months, and then it escalates as the project moves forward because all projects start out slow. Um, so, yeah, our, our firm would stay with you through the very end. And we would, like, you go to these construction meetings. The owner would have a representative. We've had a representative. The builder would have a representative. Any player that's got a dog in the hunt in the next 30 days, whether it's the tile layer or the appliance guy, is going to be there to answer questions. And out of that will come a report that goes out to everybody so everybody stays on the same page. And part of that as well is doing uh, uh, pay applications. You know, we review all the pay applications and verify what's being said is done. It's actually done to protect the owner. So that's all part of their last phase of our work construction administration. Yeah, and we we uh, I've, I've had instances that that part of the project is not insignificant in any way because there's a you know uh, it's all it's seeing through the design intent it's ensuring that the design intent is met we all had an idea you guys bought off on the idea believe that that's what you wanted and then we're there to administer uh, the execution of that in, in a from a from an intellectual standpoint. Um, we, I've had instances, the other things that from a construction administration, why you would want that, you certainly want that on your projects because we protect you. And we, we have, we're contracted directly with the owner um, and then the owner is contracted directly with the general contractor. But in that process, we provide, like Mark was alluding to, is we look at, we, we verify pay app, payment applications, make sure that all the billing is correct and that type of thing uh, before we send it off to, to you for approval. And then, um, you know, if a change order comes in, some, some sort of a change order comes in, we're able to evaluate those as, 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 the, as the architect, we evaluate those change orders in, in both um, validity and uh, in relation to the contract documents to make sure that, hey, this, this is a legitimate change. 
I've had I had one just recently where where I had a meeting with a general contractor on a project. My owner called us up and said, "Hey, they're they're sent over. They want to amend the contract for seventy seventy something thousand dollars." And I started looking into it, and I was like, "Well, this should have been in the contract. Or they caused they caused this. It wasn't it wasn't my owner. Nothing that the design team had caused." And we were able to get that particular that was one meeting. And we got that number down from seventy thousand dollars to about twenty five, uh, and so that's just one instance, and that that happens all the time. They they have to be watched, uh, and, it's, and it's not that they're trying to slight you; they just don't have the same information we have. We have we have a background, and we we've, we've been with this project from day one, and we understand what our intent is to to a degree nobody else can, uh, and so. We just hold tight to that and, and uh, make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, and, and that's a service to the owner. Well, and another example, we're doing a project in Washington, and the kitchen equipment came back at two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we're looking at it, it's like, but and we we weren't the kitchen, we didn't, we weren't the coordinator for the kitchen design, and all the equipment is new. Well, by analyzing the existing equipment, what's good, what can be safe, we got that down from two hundred fifty to one hundred and ten. That's a significant chunk in an eight hundred thousand dollar budget. So just having somebody, I mean, that's what we do. We represent you once the building goes under construction. Great. Hey guys, let's talk let's go back to timelines um um for a second. And uh you told us about the initial assessment taking about ninety to one hundred and twenty days. When a house corporation decides to move ahead with a project, talk a little bit from there what the time is needed um, to either, um, you know, for a renovation project or for a, a rebuild. What, what's a house corporation looking at? Uh, in, after in the pre-design, we would be looking at at a time frame to produce documents in the range of four to six months uh, and that would that's that's kind of once the decisions made the design decisions are all made that's just just production time um, the next timeline you'd be looking at was is a permitting in the permitting process and then bidding and negotiation uh, both of those again depending on the municipality that you're working with can can range from uh, a month to three months uh, to get to get a permit once the documents are in the permit and so um, and then bidding negotiations just to, really we kind of overlap those with permitting because we can do that in the meantime we usually have enough time to be able to get that done um, during the same time that we're doing permitting and typically what we'll do is so where the builder will come in I want it my hundred and hundred year anniversary is fall of 24. It's like, okay, so if you, for this scope of work, if you're going to be in a fall 24, we need to start in spring of 23. So that means we're turning ground in spring of 23. I will want to have all my subs and all my trades, if I'm the GC, lined up. So we're going to probably give him, you know, until like the first of, of, uh, of April. So then I'm working backwards from how long should I allow for permit? Let's allow 90 days. Okay, so I have to have permit documents ready by the first of the year. Then let's back up from there. How long will it take us to get there, depending on where we are, what that timetable is. Sean, you know, Sean gave you a span there because it's like, damn, we only have, we, are, we have got to hit the ground running. Oh, oh yeah, awesome. That's problem. That schedule's no problem. But you want to start from where you need to be in and just allow the appropriate times behind. And then typically we'll figure out how to start it where we can make it happen. And that also plays into those time frames can be you know accelerated through delivery method and things like that with the general contractor as well um, mark was alluding to a situation essentially that's a construction management delivery method that gets that contractor on board earlier and then gives him the opportunity to the, the owner can fast track it and and have a you know do a foundation um, you know civil do a civil foundation permit or something to in that nature uh, in the beginning of a project and again buy some time and allow allow the contractor to get mobilized and uh, you know get familiar with the project a little sooner than they would typically and then we use them also in a construction management delivery method for consulting with regard to constructability 
and things of that nature to say to get the best bang for your buck. So I think I followed what you said. So, you know, preparing the actual plans and design architectural documents, four to six months, bidding one to three months, and then the actual construction, is that a nine to 12? It's going to be, you're going to start in May and finish of August if it's a, a year later, if it's a big project. So that'd be 14 months. It actually depends on your school schedule. Um, and um, that would be that would be typical. But if it's like, man, we absolutely cannot find another place for the men to live. Uh, we can't lose that revenue. Then we can see, you know, can we do it in a multi multi-phase approach that we can do in three to four months over the course of three summers? We just finished a project, a house that we've been working on for the last eh, 12 or 12 years, finished our fourth phase two years ago. And the first thing was interior renovation and bathrooms and bedrooms and quarters. And the last big thing was the chapter room, which we started over Christmas break, worked on spring break, and we're able to finish it up. So it would all depend on your program, your scope of work, and what your, your needs were. Last question for me, um, Thomas, I don't know if we have any more from the audience. No, there's no more and we're hitting that hour point anyway. So yeah, last question from you. Yep. Perfect. Um, uh, in a recent conference I, I uh, attended, there were some discussions about a newer trend of sort of a lodge type of configuration where there'd be um, study spaces, kitchen and dining, but no living spaces. Have you have you discussed this with any of your clients? And do you think that you know this concept with people living together and and their high demands for you know very specific living conditions? Do you think this is going to catch on this lodge, eating, studying kind of configuration? I don't think it's going to go away. And in a lot of situations, I think it's a good solution. We've worked on several. We have a couple we're working on now. You can have a residential lodge, which is usually, like I'm going to set a perfect example. Let's say your lodge 60 feet wide, so you have parking, first floor, then you have all your public space on the second floor, and you have bedrooms upstairs that maybe will sleep 12 men. So you have somebody living in the house. You have a catering kitchen uh, where pizza is brought in or Taco Tuesday, whatever. Uh, what's nice about that is having people living in the house to kind of oversee it, make sure it works. And that can be your officers or, you know, whatever. What's bad about that is that you have people living in the house and there will be, there will be that damage, but you have the public space and then some personal space. And then there is the non-residential lodge, which is it's just for meeting, for, for social, for chapter, for whatnot. Um, and that has, we're working on one now, Louisiana Tech, because that's the standard there. And so we're expanding the one that they have. Uh, we're working on at one at UT uh, that they have sold their land um, to a developer and they're going to build a six story apartment building on that site. But this fraternity is getting the front uh, right corner along the street, 8,000 8, square feet, 5,000 down, 2,000 up. So it has all the public space uh, that they need and it has meeting space. It's awesome. But it's an apartment building where they can live. So they can live in that apartment building, have all the privacy they want in the world, but still have the fraternity in-house, if you will. So I think there's lots of interpretations on how the lodge concepts can play out. Uh, but where land is expensive, like it is at UT, it's viable. Where property taxes are so high, like, like in Texas, it's viable. Or if that's the, if that's the kind of the, the college standard, then I think it's viable. And do you do that or do nothing if you, if you, if you can't sustain you know, people wanting to live in because it becomes a bigger issue, um, then I think you can look at a lodge and it can be successful. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Mark and Sean. Um, Thomas, thank you for uh, uh, joining us, brothers, tonight. Um, we want to remind you that uh, Fiji Academy is coming up uh, January 3rd through the 5th. We're going to have a housing track. Um, available for House Corporation members, uh, and we'll have a great lineup of speakers. We'll be uh, sharing information about that in the next probably 30 days, so we'd encourage you to at least save the date in your calendar, and uh, hopefully you can join us um, at Academy and uh, participate in the housing track. Uh, again, Mark, Sean, thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate it, and 
Um, brothers, we have their information on our website. So if you're interested in contacting them, and uh, of course their information's on the screen right now, but uh, you're more than welcome uh, also to go to the FIGAM website under the housing uh, section and you'll see their information. Awesome. Hey, Steve, Tom, Thomas, thank you so much. We really appreciate yep. the opportunity. Yep. Thank you, guys. Of course. You guys have a good night.